today we've got a plethora of topics for you guys. We're going to start off with, um, actually no, stop that. I have not thrown the mic on here yet. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Making It a Medicine podcast. So, today, if you have not already noticed, we are filming in a brand new space, okay? The audio quality is better. The video quality is better. We're pulling out all the stops for you guys, okay? So, with that, we've got a plethora of topics that we're going to be talking about, okay? So, today we're going to be talking about mainly the UK FPO changes, um, a couple of things to do with kind of just the general state of the NHS, and we're gonna be opening up the conversation to you guys uh, and just talking about the survey, progress, as well as kind of the next three to four years for, for the majority of med students, okay? Yeah, specifically so, the uh, junior doctor strikes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, why don't we jump straight into it, okay? So if you haven't been living under a rock as a medical student for the past week and a half or two <laughs> weeks, um, you might have noticed that the UK Foundation Program Office, I think is, is, that's what the UK FPO stands for. I don't know. Might um, not be office. You I'm know not. better than me. Yeah. Um, but they've proposed some changes to the selection of um, foundation school preferencing. Okay. Now, essentially, um, they hosted a webinar which in which they explained what they propose. And essentially what they're proposing in a scrapping what they're proposing is a scrapping of the old system where you kind of, you, you were ranked based on an EPM score, right? And that was based on how well you did at university in, in your finals exams. Uh, and that preference gave you access to kind of, the, if the better you did, the more likely you were to get your top preferences, okay? So that's all being scrapped according to this proposal. Now, it's very controversial opinions related to this because what they've suggested instead is essentially to scrap the competitive EPM score, to scrap the SJT, mm. uh, and instead say if there were 9,000 graduates that year, then a computer would then give each person uh, an assigned number of 1 to 9,000, and that's kind of randomly allocated. And then there'd kind of be a, you'd still have your preferences listed, but there would be no kind of control over what rank and preference um, allocation that you got. Okay. So. Let's open up the discussion because a lot of people have a lot of opinions and some of you might have some opinions before this episode that might change after it. So <laughs> I'd like to ask you, Toy, first of all, right, what do okay. you think about this? Well, I personally believe taking this change will make the biggest impact on behavior of medical students. Mm -hmm. So now most people aren't really going to try as hard as they were before. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is if you live in like Scunthorpe, you're gonna get you're gonna get it pretty easily, regardless. Probably weren't really caring about your ranking that much, but like yourself, if you want to work in London, for example, now that's where it becomes an issue. So there's something called competition ratios, right? And the competition ratios, they say if the competition ratio is two, that means for every job there is, or for every F1 post, there's two people applying. So the higher the competition ratio, the harder it is to get in. Now West London, according to last year's competition ratio. 2.78 which is the highest one now before as in now how it is now before this proposal mm. you could work hard in medical school get a good ranking and be like okay i stand a good chance of going to where i want to go yeah and you'd have to put your blood sweat and tears into getting that good ranking but now just flip the coin man yeah that's all it is it's chance now yeah. i think doing that means a lot of medical students well, not a lot but a good proportion of the ones who worked day and night to be able to get a certain F1 post are now just not going to try. Yeah. To the level they were trying before. I'm not going to say they're going to give up. Exactly. to the level they were trying before. I think you raise a really good point there because especially in terms of the time frame of them wanting to execute this. So essentially, um, the soonest they said that they could execute this is roughly around 2024. Okay. Now that means for people who are graduating within 2024, 2025, <laughs> That includes us, people who've been at medical school for at least three years now. Yeah. Okay. And now what that means is potentially they well <laughs> I laugh because there was literally a question asked about this on the webinar, which said, So, does that mean all my hard work previously now means nothing? <laughs> now that that was absolutely hilarious to me because the way they answered it 
was very have you seen those like interviews with like celebrities or whatever or like politicians and they're very media trained answers yeah it was yeah. kind of like no but you're you're you know you know your your hard work and your accolades will still be yeah. they'll still be your accolades you'll still, still get be... the credits you'll still get the letters yeah. of excellence listen but it the epm score don't matter no more it don't mean <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't mean, mean anything anymore. nothing yeah which yeah so it well it doesn't mean anything re it doesn't mean anything in reference to your foundation allocation. Yeah, but I mean, even specialty training. Like, do you really expect at the specialty training interview for them to be like, yeah, what did you get in medical school? And mm. that was a while ago. Do you, mm. know, you would have cut a lot of stages. You would have had to perform in certain exams. Yeah. They'll ask about those exams rather than your medical school finals. Yeah. And if the ranking for F1 placement is just randomly allocated, Oh, by the way, the reason they're doing that, actually, we're going to go into a bit of a conspiracy hole, rabbit hole right now. The reason they're doing that is because the NHS, as we know, is struggling right now, correct? Now, there are certain places in the UK that are struggling much more than the cities because the cities are oversubscribed to in terms of how many doctors yeah, want to yeah. work there. Doctors' jobs, yeah. Like I said, 2.78 people. Yeah. I don't know who the 0.78 person is, but 2.78 <laughs> people who want to work in London versus... I don't know what Scunthorpe's <laughs> competition ratio is. No, because there are really places with like less than one. Yeah. Like there's half a person oh, yeah. applying to yeah. these job posts. Where I want to go is 0 0.78. So I couldn't give two about what happens with the rankings. Yeah. But, you know, for people who want to work in London, it's done. But so the reason they're doing this is so that these places that have undersubscribed doctors wanting to apply to work there, they get more doctors now so that those areas are able to stay afloat just that bit longer. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're making these changes from 2024 and then you talk to these doctors and then they're saying, by the time you graduate, the NHS will change. By the time you graduate, you'll be okay. By the time you graduate, your pay will be okay. At this rate, it doesn't look like it. I feel like, a bit of an unpopular opinion, but I feel like the government and the regulatory bodies of the NHS are going to make changes to the education, to the training and to the way it the system works mm. just long enough for them to keep the NHS afloat, to keep it above water and to keep it from drowning. So if you're expecting by the time you graduate and you're like a second or third year medical student for the NHS to be okay and like you're paid to be absolutely fine for you to get a 25% pay rise, I don't know. I just think it looks a bit unrealistic right now because they're making these changes and what that means is the NHS will be a bit smoother. Mm. It will be able to stay afloat. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think I do agree with you. Like, it it seems that might be the only reason why they're putting such a rush on it. Yeah. Because yeah. logically you'd think, okay, yes, these changes might be beneficial and we'll come on to why they might be beneficial. But to implement them so quickly, why wouldn't you wait until, you know, the people who are just now getting into medical school, so say September 2023, so wait for that year for when they graduate, apply it to the year that they graduate because then they'll have made... Uh, an informed choice they will have known all the options they'll have known all the changes rather than imposing it on people who've already kind of developed a system of way of working for the past three years at medical school who've slaved away you know lost you know social hours relationships and all this just to try and acquire that you know that, <laughs> that, that coveted that, yeah, f1 post yeah that, F, that <laughs> yeah. epm score that will allow them to have con some semblance of control in where they get posted for their f1 and f2 yeah um which yeah i think that's probably the major downfall of kind of these proposal of changes is is it feels like a real loss of control. It feels like yeah. we are simply just subject to the system and we there's there's nothing we can do about it. I feel like that was the case the whole time, but I mean <laughs> Well, I mean, if you look at it like that, we're gonna have to answer some some deeper philosophical <laughs> questions about, you know, depend even if it's just medicine or just the working world in general. Yeah. Is it just a system? Um, anyway, that's yeah. a whole different episode. But to in talk terms about. of the actual change, I think at a medical student level, one, the behavior will be affected. Mm -hmm. Two, people are just gonna kind of like like I said, the behavior, but the hard work I don't think people understand how much of a detriment that will actually make to future doctors. The reason that doctors are competent is because they've been put through these intense exams and these intense steps that they have to get through and pass. And that ensures their competence. Now, if you're not ensuring their competence by making them compete for a ranking, by making them compete for this, compete for that, then how can you ensure the competence of doctors? Mm -hmm. And that was a question that they were asked in the webinar. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're also removing the SJT. So yeah. the situational judgment test, this basically means like if someone's dying, but they've got DNR tattooed on their chest, what do you do? Like that kind of, that kind yeah. of question, but obviously much harder than that. Yeah, I think, I think one of the important points actually with, to do with the SJT being removed is um, 
again, another question was asked about like letting people slip through the cra- letting people slip through the cracks. And some people might be academically gifted and you know very well inclined to do well at exams, but they might not have the kind of social awareness and the kind of professionalism that, that is required for you to be a doctor um, or a good doctor. Let yeah. me let me put it that way. Um, so it's I think they, they said that there's going to be some kind of adjustment to look for those individuals who slip through the cracks. There was a certain percentage they said like bit like below a certain cutoff score or something like that. But mm. I think that's another consideration to take on that there are also not just academic parts to becoming a doctor, but there's also, you know, professional and, you know, yeah, the standards just, that have to be met. Yeah. I mean, you're putting your life in someone's hands. Yeah. And if you're not sure of, of their competence, then how can you, you know, measure that? Yeah. Okay. So I think we've talked a little bit about the kind of the pain that this this change might cause some people. Oh, um, but there is some sweet side to it as well. There is. There really, I mean, really is. I, I think f- when you sit down yeah. and really think about what this really means... Um, you start to really understand how it might actually affect you. So I initially I was like, oh, what are you guys doing? Like, I have no I have no control over this now. Like, I feel mm. like you mm. feel lost at sea almost. Um, but they raised kind of a pretty valid point, which is the aim of this is to reduce the stress of medical students um, and kind of F1 and F2 professionals. Because trying to work for that EPM, you know, giving up your social life, you know, doing all these things to make sure that you have a good EPM and a good SJT, it means that, you know, it's a lot of stress. Like, yeah, we, everyone knows, exactly, everyone knows. Yeah. We train for five years, well, we study for five years at university just to get an F1 place, right? Yeah. And if, if that's very, very stressful, that's st- five years of straight stress. Now, if you remove the competition, mm. that means you're not going to be nearly as stressed. Yeah, that you won't, allows yeah. you room in your life for relaxation a little bit more relaxation also room in your life to expand as a human being so not just be academic doctor medicine focused you're able to branch out you're able to play some sports you're able to start a business venture you're able to do all the other things that most people on other degrees probably do have the time to do Mm. um but now you're in medicine and before we, we weren't able to do that so this change might actually allow us to be able to spread our wings and do other things beyond just practice for medicine yeah i completely agree i think uh, a lot of students might need that as well yeah a lot of medical students might yeah. need that i mean a lot there is kind of the culture of you know medicine is your life yeah and that's all it is but yeah there is a world out there you know like i mean even if you wanted to do nothing with your time you're still more chill yeah <laughs> to be honest, you like, can still watch more netflix if you wanted to do exactly, that exactly actually like, no but here's the thing with i feel like med students are this weird breed of human being right mm. so if we're not thinking about medicine we're probably going to be watching something to do with medicine or trying to get involved in it in some way or at least that might be just me maybe i'm just a bit of a weirdo <laughs> but like, like even today like i was watching i got so bored um just revising and i was like i need to i need some reinvigoration i need something and i was like i was like scrolling through netflix i've watched everything on netflix um looking at <laughs> prime video everything's boring and then i went on bbc iplay i started watching um what is it called hospital hospital <laughs> it's literally about surgeons that's a creative name yeah i know right <laughs> um it's literally about surgeons and like the cutting edge of medicine and that's the only thing that retained my attention um outside of medicine itself i guess um which is really really a bit ironic which means i, I feel like i don't know i don't know if that's just me or if it's medical that students just means you general. enjoy you enjoy what you're doing yeah there's nothing wrong with that yeah i mean there was uh, right so i saw this video on tiktok mm. by some certain egghead right <laughs> and he was saying like it's about the junior strikes yeah. junior doctor strikes so for anyone who doesn't know the junior doctors are striking for 72 hours so three days and he was saying that, oh, like, they're complaining again. They're moaning again. This isn't the first time they've moaned about this. They moaned about unsocial about hours in the mm-hmm. beginning. And then he said, um, like you said, so like, like you said, you, you love, you know, what you're, what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you have passion for it. And then he said, like, oh, it's almost as if it was your career choice, wasn't it? So why are you complaining? And there's, this narrative has been, like, spewed into so much, like, of social media. Mm. You just scroll and you see all these people, like, getting angry at junior doctors for striking. Right, so this guy, he was saying, it was your career choice, you know, and then he started bringing up all the numbers, right? He was like, 
he said, oh, F1 in a basic trade. He said basic as if it's basic, right? As if mm. it's basic to get there. Anyway, he said basic training, the most basic training, they're getting paid 29,000 pounds a year. That's minimum. And he was saying that's minimum, right? But you're forgetting that our opportunity cost to get there, so opportunity cost is if you hadn't have done that, something else you could have done, i.e. just working minimum wage in, in a retail store, for example. We would, we at the time we graduate, we're at minimum £150,000 down already. Then you're putting us on a £29,000 a year job. Mm. That's way too low. If you think about opportunity cost. Yeah, I feel, I feel like if a, a good way to compare this for, for people who aren't in medical school is look at the kind of financial place of someone who's five years from sixth form, who's gone to university in five years from sixth form. Yeah. So they've done their three years. Screw it. <laughs> so they've done <laughs> so they've done their three years um and now they're two years of experience in yeah right yeah. and not just that hold on i'm gonna say probably something that a lot of these people who make these videos they don't want to hear but not just compare someone who's gone to university yeah someone who's gone to university and did a stem degree yeah that's important to yeah, say yeah, yeah and that has got the similar grades that someone who's gotten to get into medical school yeah because at the end of the day this is a meritoc meritocratic society exactly right? you get what you put in now if i didn't go to uni and i just got any any minimum wage job and mm. i'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that i'm just saying if i didn't try hard to study and get into here then i would expect someone who has studied hard to get into medical school or to get into engineering or something mm. like that and finish it then earn much more than me because they put more effort to get there. And that's yeah. just how life works. Like, And I think, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think people forget that there's, that's, that's just one side of the argument because oh, yeah. you forget that junior doctors, F1s and F2s, these are the people who do the, the legwork, the grunt work, who wake up night shifts. Like you'll do a full five day yeah, week yeah. and then they're like, oh yeah, it's a black weekend, mate. Yeah. You have to work seven days in the week and then it's again normal week monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday again yeah. and it's relentless within this it's not you're not just sitting at a desk you know doing paperwork yeah, which no, no. there is a lot of that but at the same time you're and um, being an emotional rock pillar right for your patients yeah, yeah you're being you're literally seeing traumatic stuff that the majority of people will rarely witness more than once or twice in their life on a daily, hourly, minute basis. Exactly. So yeah. when you think about that and you're like, it's only 29,000. Mate, <laughs> the cost that I'm paying in my soul, <laughs> in my soul, <laughs> only 29,000. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Take no, it as is. It's, it's so silly. It's so silly. This whole conversation. And then they're like, after that, they're on minimum 40,000. So why are they complaining? Bro, if I went to America... Do you know how much I'd be paid there? I was born in America. I just fuck, just fuck off now. But do you know? Do you know how much I'd be paid there? It's crazy. And then ask yourself. So let's say a doctor gets paid a hundred thousand pounds here. Let's say a consultant or high ST six seven whatever it is. Then that same doctor in America will get paid two hundred three hundred thousand. Mm. Let's say three hundred thousand because that's not even that wild of a number, by the way. Google it. So that two hundred thousand difference. They've those two doctors aren't any different. Let's say they're the same doctor. That same doctor can go to America and earn that much. Mm. If those two doctors are not any different, then where has that £200,000 gone? Now, I'll tell you where it's gone. It's gone to the society in order for us to be able to provide free healthcare. So a lot of these people on TikTok are saying, oh, why are junior doctors striking? They're complaining, moaning, blah, blah, blah. Would you like this to become America? Do you want to? Do you want to pay that much for your own healthcare? Mm. And then we enjoy a much higher salary. A lot of the doctors out here and most of the people in the NHS who are healthcare workers don't actually want it to become private, even though their salary would increase double. Like, yeah. This is how much of a good heart these people have. Yeah, people yet they're that. being Yet they're being absolutely demonized for just wanting, in comparison to that £200,000 increase, a very small pay rise. People are like, oh, 25% or whatever, 29%. I don't know what the percent is. Yeah. It's in that. They're like, oh, that's so high, you know. Why are we giving that them? Everyone's everyone else is working for less. Like, why are they complaining? Bro. I think like people like it's just important to remember the fact that we're all humans. Like, we're not robots. Like, we're <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It takes a toll on people. And, and it's also important to remember that in this world, there's something known as global market competition. 
Now, global market competition means a country is competing with another country for resources. Now, resources such as healthcare are run by doctors and nurses and, you know, the healthcare mm -hmm. professionals. Now, if one country is competing with another one for doctors, how are they going to win doctors over? They pay them more, right? That's why loads of doctors are leaving. And then for you to say, don't have the pay rise, you're shooting yourself in the foot because then there will come a day where it all become private mm. and you're going to be paying way more than you did in taxes. Way more. Yeah, I think like the, the current leaving rate is currently like, what, about 40, 40 staff per week are leaving the NHS? 40. Per week. And that's, that's the, like the minimum number, I, can't, I, I think, which that should goes to show like... You hear people on, on the wards being like, oh, yeah, I had a mate who went to Australia. He's living life now. He's getting paid. He's, his work-life balance is amazing. Yeah, and yeah. you're just like, nah. Yeah. We're in for a ride here, you know? And I don't know. It's also I the regulation. The so, the way, so the way the system works here, and this is something I found out recently. The way the system works here is, you know, that you, you, talk, you told me about it. The mm. SD7s or SD8s getting stuck at SD and never becoming a consultant. Now, if... The NHS hadn't have done that, they would be treating their SD7s and SD8s much better and they would want to stay in the NHS. But there's a lot of foreign SD6s or SD5s or even SD3s or 2s, right? I'm not going to name names, I'm not snitch. But what they do <laughs> is that they'll do their MRCS or their FRCS in this country. As soon as that's done, they get out and go back to their home country and then sign with the regulatory authority there. Mm. They don't need to have become a consultant here. They just mm. need working proficiency in their profession. Then they go back there and they earn like four times the salary. Mm. And then you wonder why all these doctors leaving or why the doctors fed up of this country. Because it's oppression. This is like systematic oppression of doctors training. Mm. That's all it is. Yeah, it's a it's a real problem that needs to be fixed. And to do with that consultancy thing, um, I I realized why. <laughs> oh, wait, should we explain to people like what it is in case so, they don't know? Yeah. So essentially, um, when you do your training, so I'm personally very interested in surgery. Um, currently, still cardiothoracics. For those of you still wondering, um, <laughs> you kind of you you do your medical school five years. You do your F one, your F two, and then you apply for specialty training. So you. For me personally, I'd apply to core surgical training. So that would be um, C CST1 or CT1, okay? Um, and that can last between two to three years. So you can go from CT1, CT2, CT3. And that's when you're starting to learn the ropes of general surgery. And da -da -da -da. It, now from, from core training, um, then you apply for kind of your, your specialty or subspecialty. So that would be something like cardiothoracics where you'd start at either ST1 or ST3. So the, the pathways are a little bit complicated in that there's kind of two running pathways for cardiothoracics and it differs between specialties, but that doesn't really matter. Essentially for a surgeon, you then train for the next seven years. So for, through ST1 to ST7, okay? So that you can become proficient in performing the surgeries required to help your patients. Now, to get to consultancy ship, mind you, all the way through this, it's, it's getting tighter and tighter bottlenecks. Like fewer and fewer people make the cut at each kind of upgrade mm. level. So mm. people saying, oh, you get paid 60,000, mate, only very few people get paid yeah. 60,000. Not that many people do. Um, and so when you get to like ST7, ST8, and you want to become a consultant, here's where it gets tricky because everyone's like, yeah, just get to consultant, you know, hit it out at 30, 31, you're, you're good, you're pay, getting paid 80,000, life is sweet. Uh -huh. da -da -da. Uh -huh. Little do you know, <laughs> little do you know, you only really get a consultancy ship if someone has either moved country, died, or retired. Those are the only three times you'll get a consultancy post available because otherwise all the consultancy ships are filled. Mm. The reason that they're not making more is because it costs £80,000 to pay each consultant annually. Yeah, that's still low. They don't that's still have low. the money to expand consultancy ships. So what they end up with is a dead end yeah. of just... Filled consultancy ships and mm. a bunch, a literal, like, it's insane. ST7s everywhere. Yeah. Do you know what and I mean? This is for those ST7s or ST8s that are trapped in that stage, right? There's other countries you can go to, but I think Canada are quite strict, aren't they? They need you to yeah. be a consultant here. And then Australia might be the same thing, I believe. I'm not sure. I haven't looked into anyway, Australia. I would imagine that European or th those types of countries would be strict. If you go to Dubai or if you go to Iraq or a Middle Eastern country, they don't need you to be a consultant. 
you can set up a private clinic there and work as a consultant. And all you need to do is provide your MRCS or your FRCS exam results and that certificate that you get to them. Damn, I didn't know that. Yeah, bro. I got told <laughs> this by... Um, oh, I won't say a name. But I got told this by um, a friend of my dad's and he was an orthopedic surgeon for 30 years in Iraq. Mm. And he was the person who set up the GMC equivalent but in, in Iraq. Mm. So he was one of the founders, one of the 11 founders. And he said that's how they set it up. Damn. And that helps alleviate your feeling of being trapped. Yeah. So if you're stuck in that position and you, you don't mind moving country in order to earn like, I'd say easily, three, 400,000 a year, go there and then just sign up with a regulatory there. I'm pretty sure Dubai would, would love to have them. Um, you know, any of the UAE countries. Mm. Uh, I think it's, it's difficult though, because when we talk about these sorts of things, you realize that this is part of the contribution to people leaving. Yeah. But you ask yourself, is the problem that people keep leaving or is the problem that there are so many reasons to leave here is why people keep leaving? Do you want to address the reasons why people want to leave? Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's a bit of a contentious topic. And this is the type of um, discussion we want all of your guys' opinion on. OK, we want to hear what do you think? What would you do if you were that ST7 trapped here? What would you do if you were the junior doctor? OK, um, so feel free to literally comment on this video. DM us on Instagram. Just interact with us constantly. I think we might be restarting the Twitter, even though Twitter's a bit of a <laughs> it's a bit of a, a war zone. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, the, these, this is the reason we want to have these discussions. Okay. I think even if you're trapped at an ST7 or ST8, you can't set up your own private clinic, can you? you I'm not sure about the regulations on that. I'm not sure if you can, because I feel like they need you to be a consultant, maybe. I mm. think especially with surgery. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Someone can give us the answer on that. I have no idea. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the kind of SJT changes and the UKFPO changes, as well as the junior doctor strikes. Um, <clears throat> I think... So running, coming up on 30 minutes, yep. um, we'll just wrap up kind of like a summary of UKFPO and then we'll do BMAT episode, yeah? Yep, sounds good. Okay, so... Okay, so essentially just to wrap up what we've talked about today is the UKFPO are suggesting that get rid of the competition. Um, <laughs> It could, you could, depending on the length that you look at it through, it could be good or it could be bad. That's what we want to hear your guys' opinion on. We've kind of let you know our thoughts, okay? Um, now we want to hear yours, okay? As well as this, um, I think just one tidbit of information I think they said before is just to soften the, the misconceptions that they said. They said that there's no better training in, say, London deanery schools for foundation mm, than they yeah they would say that though, they? they would they would say that but to be honest to be honest <laughs> just to play devil's advocate i, I was uh, at a surgical conference in manchester and i was talking to one of the vascular regs and he was basically like try not to go to a big teaching hospital the reason is those big teaching hospitals will prioritize the teaching of the regs the, uh. the, the people who are slightly more senior because that's where all the interesting cases go if you're f1 f2 yeah, you're going to be bottom of the totem pole. Mm. So they do raise a bit of a fair point. For F1 and F2, I don't think it matters so much exactly where you go in terms of like, if I want to go to a big teaching hospital, it's going to give me all the opportunities. Think of where are you going to get the most exper practical experience of being a junior doctor? Where will you be in demand the most? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm actually not too fussed about where I go. Um, I've never really been a person who's like, really, I need to be home. I've, yeah, yeah. I'll decide where my home is when I want to. <laughs> um, but but right now, I I wouldn't mind going wherever as long as I make sure that I maximize my opportunities for number one, clinical experience, number two, research, and number three, just an overall like good experience for F1 and F2. Yeah. Those yeah. are the three things that I would consider. Aside from that, um, everyone has their own individual choices. So, mm, yeah. All right, so that's going to wrap up today's episode, unless there's anything else you want to you wanna touch on. Uh, no, I just want to hear everyone's opinions on yeah, the I'm really, yeah, yeah, I'm just really excited yeah. to open up this conversation. By yeah. the way, actually, ooh, very important dates. So I believe that the UKFBO website survey 
is being closed in about three days. We're filming this on the 25th, okay? So if you want your opinion, uh, I say opinion to be counted, but it's not actually a vote. They're just taking opinions, but they'll probably... <laughs> the, the UK Health... What is it? You Public Health England? Yeah, well, yeah. They, so. the, the health body of the, the four nations, so England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, will ultimately make the decisions for their regions. Um, but the, the survey to voice your opinion to the UKFPO will close on the uh, February the 28th of 2023. Um, we'll put a link to that in the description because it is buried deep in the <laughs> bellies of that website. Um, yeah, it took us ages to find it. Yeah, yeah. And then even then, it's just a survey. You just hear your opinions. Exactly. Um but yeah, I think they said that they, they'll roughly try to make a decision anticipated for roughly the end of spring 2023. That's, so that's not too far from now. Actually. It's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. I think it's very rare for them to just come up with an official proposal and be like, hey, we'll yeah. let them decide. Yeah. No, that's just them letting you know what's about to come. The, the, the purpose there's... of it is to save the NHS. Exactly. And that's the only purpose. If it's for the greater good, if it's a consequentialist mindset, then you know what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah. You know? 100%. Yeah. And they always say it's for your benefit. It's so you don't get stressed. Mm -hmm. It's for your safety. Most of the time. There's another reason. But yeah. I don't mind it to be fun. Yeah. I yeah, like it. I. But, yeah. Anyway, so that's going to wrap us up. Okay. So, guys, don't forget to number one, like and subscribe because I know we're on YouTube now. So I always remember to say <laughs> that. Uh, number two, uh, follow us on Twitter, Instagram at Make It In Med, as well as, you know, give the uh, MedCamps page a nice little follow. Yeah. Um, as well as also, don't forget to comment your opinions and reply to our Instagram stories because I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely want to hear all of what you guys have to say um, because we're the people who it's going to be affecting. So yeah. we need to know what we actually think. Yeah. All right then. So that's going to call it for today uh, and we'll see you guys in our next episode. See you soon.